space. Moving on to the theme of today's webinar, it often feels like barely a week goes by without an article relating to pregnancy and maternity in the workplace featuring in the news. This is often around employees finding themselves at an employment tribunal because they haven't treated an employee fairly while pregnant or on maternity leave. Linda is going to talk you through the regulations around maternity leave and what best practice looks like when supporting employees through their pregnancy, maternity and return to work. I'll now hand over to Linda who will take you through today's topic, HR Essentials, Maternity Leave the Right Way. Good morning guys, welcome to the webinar. Um, today's agenda, as you can see, is about the journey through um, from the employee first getting pregnant right to the return to work phase. So we're going to cover each section um, on a slide. Um, like I say, let, like Hannah says, any questions at any time, just pop them in the in the little box, and I'll try to answer as many as I can at the end of the webinar. Okay. So the first slide um, we're going to discuss today is the pregnancy announcement. So employees must tell their employer about the pregnancy at least 15 weeks before the, the week the baby's due. So they call this 15th week the qualifying week. It may not always be possible, because some people find out they're pregnant late, but um, generally people will know by this time and they have to put their application for maternity leave in writing at this point. Employees who become pregnant will have mixed emotions and opinions about the right time to share the information. And it may be different at different times for different reasons. Maybe you work in manufacturing and your job includes heavy lifting and you need to let people know that you're pregnant. Or maybe you just want to keep it a secret because you've had bad experiences in the past and you work in an office and you don't really need to tell anyone. So um, it varies from individual to individual. There's no obligation to tell you straight away, but sometimes it is helpful if they do and not always necessary. So once we get this application for maternity leave, we want to look at the entitlement to maternity leave. Um, so in order to qualify for statutory maternity um, leave, an employee just must be an employee and not a worker. It's quite straightforward. You, any employee from day one rise is the right to 52 weeks maternity leave. There's no qualifying period for maternity leave. It is just, you've just got to be an employee and be employed. Entitlement to maternity um, leave is broken up into different sections. So all employees must legally have two weeks compulsory leave. So the, the full 52 weeks is broken up into sections. So that's two weeks compulsory leave, where this is the direct, the two weeks directly after the baby's birth. The first day doesn't count. Say you're bit, the baby comes early and um, so the baby comes, say, um, on the I don't know what today the and they're not already on maternity leave the maternity leave will start tomorrow and they have to take that two week period off legally if they work in maybe a shop or an office environment if they work in a manufacturing environment that two weeks is increased to four weeks so if you work in manufacturing the compulsory leave is not two weeks it's four weeks so it, ju it just changes depending on what type of business you work in but the general rule is two weeks now the earliest an employee can take their maternity leave is 11 weeks before the due date so the the employee will get um what's called a mat b1 from the uh, midwife at around 20 weeks 22 weeks normally the time of the second scan and that will give you the baby's due date. The earliest an employee can take their leave is 11 weeks before that. So, um, and then if we want to enforce maternity leave for an employee that's off work due to a maternity related illness, the soonest we can do that is four weeks before the due date. So again, we refer back to the MAP B1. Maybe the employee was going to work right up to the baby's birth. Unfortunately, she may be off with a maternity related illness. We can, as an employer, enforce maternity leave for, from four weeks before the baby's due date.
Okay, so maternity pay. So everyone's entitled to the leave aspect, but maternity pay does, the entitlement differs um, depending on the individual. So to qualify for statutory maternity pay, an employee must earn the lower earnings limit which is at least £118 per week on average. Um, so it's it's quite an important figure um, when looking at how much they normally earn and whether they will be entitled to maternity pay from yourselves. They also have had to have been employed for 26 weeks before the 15th week before the baby's birth. So if you remember earlier, we talked about the qualifying week. This is this 15 week um, before the baby's due date is called the qualifying week. And the, the mother has to have been employed for 26 weeks prior to the qualifying week. If you think about this logically, the 15 weeks plus the 26 weeks um, gives you a 41 week period. So basically, the mother has to have been employed before the pregnancy. Um, so it's a 41 week time frame. Um, but to calculate it exactly, you have to go back 15 weeks from the due date and then 26 weeks before that. The employee must, as we discussed before, provide a MAT B1, which is the evidence of her pregnancy. Um, generally, an employee will get this from their doctor or midwife around 20 weeks. However, at times, maybe a baby comes early or maybe somebody didn't know they were pregnant, they don't get this MAT B1. In, in the case where we don't have a MAP B1, all we need is evidence of a baby's birth, so um, a birth certificate or something from the doctor, something that's not necessarily a MAP B1 that proves that the lady's had a baby. But in most cases, you do get a, a MAP B1. It's very unusual um, that you don't. Now, SMP, statutory maternity pay, is paid for up to 39 weeks. So that's broken down into two sections. So that's 60, six, sorry, six weeks at 90% um, of the employee's average weekly earnings. And then the remaining 33 weeks are paid at the current SMP rate, which is £148.68 per week, or 90% of the employee's um, average weekly earnings if she earns less than £146.68 a week. Now, um, just it's important to note that the 90%, the SMP could be the same throughout the entire leave if the employee earns less than the 148.68 and more than the 118 per week. So um, it's just important to note that they may not get an enhanced part of it if they don't earn over the SMP amount. Um, so they will just get the same amount for the full 39 weeks. If the employee doesn't qualify for maternity pay from the business, um, you would then give her what's called an SMP1 form and take a copy of the MAT B1, keep that for your records and give her the original back with the SMP1 form and that will enable her to go and claim maternity allowance from the government. Okay, so your employee has told you she's pregnant and um, maybe you work in uh, an environment where there is a lot of risk. Even if you don't, it's always worth doing a health and safety risk assessment. This is to make sure that the workplace is safe enough for her to work in during her pregnancy. Um, basically, we need to repeat this as well because as the mother grows with child, things will change. So maybe if you do it at when she first tells you she's pregnant, um, by the time maybe she's into the second or even third trimester, which is, you know, when she's getting heavy and big, um, she might need different, she might have different needs, different requirements, maybe more comfort breaks, maybe she needs a bigger chair. I don't know. It's 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 always worth repeating these risk assessments throughout the pregnancy to ensure that the workplace continues to be a safe place for her to be. It's also advised to do these health and safety risk assessments um, for maternity returners who are breastfeeding. Again, just to make sure that the work environment is a safe place for her to be breastfeed, uh, to be breastfeeding or, or um, expressing milk. Sorry, the word escapes me then. <laughs> so yeah, so it's worth repeating these um, 
when she's returning from work, when she's returning to work and continuing to breastfeed. Okay, so I'm just going to give some examples of the risks to a pregnant employee. Um, so we touched on it before, heavy lifting or carrying. Um, once an employee tells you they're pregnant, if they have to lift any loads that may be considered heavy, I would um, maybe do this risk assessment and make sure that they're not lifting anything that don't feel comfortable lifting. Some people are fine. Some people are like, eh, I'm fine. I'm only pregnant and I'll lift whatever. And some people may not feel as strong or may not be as well or may have had riskier pregnancies in the past or miscarriages and may not feel they are able to lift heavy, um, heavy stuff or carrying heavy stuff. So it's each you need to take each case on its merits and make sure that that person is comfortable doing what you want them to do. And if they're not, and maybe there can sometimes be a bit of dispute over that between an employer and employee, give the advice line a call and we'll look at what we, what, whether we agree what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. But generally, I would try and avoid any kind of heavy lifting for any pregnant employees. We've also got to consider travel. Um, so, you know, people, some people find it difficult to be driving for long periods of time during pregnancy. So maybe if somebody is used to traveling a lot as part of the job, maybe consider putting them on shorter journeys. Maybe they use a lot of public transport for work. So maybe we consider limiting that during the pregnancy. Again, take each case on its own merits. If the conversation becomes difficult, maybe there's a difference of opinion. Please just give us a call. Um, yeah, standing or sitting for long periods, we would generally advise you do provide some kind of um, area for a pregnant employee to sit down to take regular rest, make sure they're not working really, really long hours, or if they are, maybe you break it up with lots of breaks, um, maybe consider not having people working, long working during pregnancy, it, you know, it's not always possible, but um, it, if you can go the extra mile um, to make sure people are not at risk, that's always good. Um, and then really importantly, making sure um, that anyone who regularly works with any harmful chemicals or substances, that there's a risk assessment done. You check out whether the products are a risk to the unborn baby or the mother and you remove that risk. Bear in mind, if you can not find um, a safe environment for your employee to work in during her pregnancy, there is always the risk of you having to put on full paid maternity suspension, which we would try and avoid at all costs by making reasonable adjustments, making sure these risk assessments are up to date. OK, so at times, unfortunately, a redundancy may occur during um, somebody's maternity leave. It happens more often than you would think. and Sometimes companies are at risk of um, thinking, well, they're not, in, they're not in work at the moment anyway, so it doesn't affect them. So I'll just talk to them when they get back. From an advice perspective, that is high risk behaviour. I would always consult with staff um, when they're on the maternity leave, the same as you would consult with staff who are in work. Remember to keep people in the loop and they need to know what's going on um, because failure to consult um, could potentially lead to a claim. Um, employees on maternity leave have stronger rights in law um, to suitable alternative employments than the employees in work at the time. It's what they call the golden ticket rule. However, they would have to be suitable for the role. So if you've got a role and you've got people that you need to you need to reduce headcounts and you've got people you need to select between, generally you have this, the maternity lever takes preference over the other employees. However, take advice because um, it may be that there are other options, you know, take advice on a case by case basis. OK, so this is a tricky little bit of law. This is this is talking about um, a famous case called the Alabaster case. Um, and we people in payroll and HR talk, talk about 
the alabaster rule. Um, what what this is is this is a case that came up with an employee um, was on maternity leave, should have got a pay rise, didn't because she was on maternity leave. She raised a, a case against Barclays Bank. She won. So what it means to us is that um, when we give a pay rise to a business when there is a lady off on maternity leave, we have to recalculate her six weeks at 90% pay. Um, because to take into account the fact that the pay rise has happened during her maternity leave. Now, your payroll company um, should do that for you. Um, I know when I worked in my previous role and more pay, I had a fully managed payroll through more pay. My, um, my payroll um, consultant, Maureen Blesser, um, used to do all that for me. So it's just an important rule. Don't forget your ladies on maternity leave when you give a pay rise while they're off because their six weeks at 90% will need recalculating to, to take into account the pay rise and then she should be paid the difference. Um, so it's just an important thing to note that some people are not necessarily aware of. Now bonuses and maternity pay. So basically bonuses that happen while people are off on maternity leave. So basically if the bonus is related to performance before she went on maternity leave or the two weeks compulsory leave or the period after she returns from maternity leave, the employee is entitled to be paid that bonus while they're off on maternity leave. Discretion, um, bonuses that relate to performance while an employee is off at, on her maternity leave outside of that time frame should not be paid or are not necessarily always paid. Discretionary bonuses, if, if the bonus is related to the performance of the employee and they're off, then they don't necessarily get that bonus. If the bonus is not related to the employee and their own performance, but maybe it's just something that is being given to the entire business, then they should be entitled to it. It's one of them things that causes a lot of confusion. And if you're not sure, give us a call. We'll go through the policy. We'll go through what the bonus is related to and we'll discuss it further. But as a rule, if everyone's getting it, she should get it. If it's based on her individual performance and she has not been working at that time, she may not get it. It depends on the rules um, of, the, of the bonus, basically. So please take advice on a case-by-case -case basis. So while your employee is off, there is the opportunity for her to work what they call kit days, keeping in touch days. These allow for reasonable contacts. Basically, um, the payment for such should be agreed before an employee goes off if you're intended to utilize them and um, you would agree how you're gonna discuss that. So would you like an email? Would you like a phone call? Would you like a text message? How would you want us to communicate with you while you're off? Um, and, how, and then also important is the same as redundancy any updates that happen during employees maternity leave so changes to the business changes to the team um team days out team nights out just anything that an employee is missing out on due to being on maternity leave should be communicated to the employee um so we can do that through kit days now um, if you are undergoing a redundancy and you need your employees to come in for a consultation meeting, you can utilise a kit day for this. Um, they can be um, utilised, um, sorry, up to 10 days can be utilised during the maternity leave period and um, they are optional. So an employee cannot come to you and say, I demand to work 10 keeping in touch days. Um, and you cannot go to your employee and say, I demand you work 10 keeping in touch days. This should be done with agreement from both sides and they can be used for 
um, training if things are happening during the employee's leave. Just maybe the employee just wants to keep in the loop, you know, and know what's going on in the business, or maybe you need the employee to work because um, a shortage of staff. It does anything, they can be used for any real um, need from either side, as long as both parties agree. You agree payment up front and everyone knows where they're up to. So returning to work. So an employee needs to provide you at the qualifying week, a written confirmation of start maternity leave start and potential return dates. If they've not told us when they're going to return, we would always assume they're going to take the full 52 weeks. Um, the employee is entitled to return to the same job um, in the after, if they return in the first 26 weeks, which the maternity 52 week period is broken down for the, these purposes into two sections, um, which is ordinary maternity leave and additional maternity leave. So if the employee returns to work in the first 26 weeks, which is the ordinary maternity leave, they are entitled to return to the same job. If they return in the additional maternity leave, so the second 26 weeks, so they've taken the full 26 weeks and they're continuing to be off, they are entitled to return to the same job or similar job if it's not appropriate. So if something happens within the workplace while that lady is off, and it's not possible for her to return to that same role, they should return to a similar role and they should not suffer a detriment as a result of this. So they should be on the same pay level, same grade, same level within the business. And they shouldn't suffer a detriment as part of, uh, because of being on maternity leave. Um, if they want to return before the end of the 52 weeks and they've not already told you in writing, they need to give you eight weeks notice in writing. Um, so so the, assume they're taking the full 52 weeks, they've not told you when they're gonna return at the point of going off, and then they then decide, right, I want to come back at the end of the pay period, which is 39 weeks. To enable you as an employer to prepare for that, they need to give you eight weeks notice in writing. Um, that enables you to take care of maybe any temporary cover that you've had while they've been off and make plans for moving forward and then coming back to work. Okay, so, um, so just a little headline on some future proposals. Um, so there's the introduction of the Pregnancy and Maternity Redundancy Protection Bill, which is um, 2019. It was introduced into Parliament and it's seeking to protect mothers from losing their job while they're off. Um, I'm sorry, whilst when they've returned from maternity leave, what it wants to do is give them extra protection upon return from maternity leave so that um, they don't come back and find they're out of a job straight away upon return from maternity leave. Um, so basically, we're not there yet, but it's, it's out there. It's been discussed in Parliament and it's a bit of a watch this space. I know there's a bit of a blurb on our website about it if you want yeah. to read more. Yes, there's a blog in the blog section under resources on our website. So if you do want to read up more on there, then you can go and have a look. Okay. And questions? Brilliant, thanks Linda. We'll now move on to the Q&A session of the webinar. I'm sure you all have lots of questions, so please continue to drop them into the questions box. Just to let you know, I will be sending a copy of the recording of the webinar and also the slides after the webinar so don't feel that you need to make lots of notes because you will get a recording of this and um, so we will make a start on the questions the first question we've received is from rob he's asked what happens to an employee's holidays during maternity leave as our policy states holidays cannot be carried over into the next holiday year okay so an employee will continue to accrue holidays during maternity leave and if their maternity leave spans a holiday year and they've not returned to work with enough time to take holidays, they should be carried over into the next holiday year. An employee should be able to take them at the end of their maternity leave. Now, 
it's important to plan for this actually because um, you know what the holiday entitlement is and you know when the employee is going off, you know when your holiday year ends. I find that you need to have an open discussion with your employee before they go off on maternity leave to say you've got X amount of holidays, our holiday year ends here, so therefore we're going to let you take an appropriate number before going off and then maybe you can let them take some ahead of time. Some people don't mind doing that, other companies um, not so much. It depends on, on whether you need that lady to work before going off on maternity leave. Um, any holidays that have spanned a holiday year, so they've gone beyond the current holiday year, I would advise that you you tag them onto the end of the leave rather than letting the employee come back and take them as free days in the next holiday year. So as long as you speak to your lady before she goes off on maternity leave, manage expectations, make arrangements so as soon as she's ready to return from her maternity leave that them holidays will be tagged on and then she will be up to date with her current holidays when she returns to work following her maternity leave and holiday period. Great, thanks Linda. Next question is from Emily. This is in relation to redundancy and maternity leave and she's asked what would we do if the employee on maternity leave does not want to come into the office to have a face-to-face -face consultation meeting to discuss a potential redundancy? Like I already mentioned, kit days are a great um, thing, they're a great invention, they're great for consultations. However, an employee may not want to take part in a kit day. And in this kind of circumstance, we're in the age of, um, in a modern age where we've got lots of um, other options. We could do it over Skype, so we can consult over Skype as long as the employee's happy to communicate via Skype. We can do it on conference call. Um, we could go to the lady herself if she's happy for us to go and see her, maybe take her a bunch of flowers and have a quick cuddle while we're there, um, with the baby, obviously, not the mother. Um, and um, yeah, it's there are other options. You don't necessarily have to bring an employee into the office. As long as any com conversation or consultation is done um, with agreement from both parties and you have um, I, I probably would advise that you have a witness to your to your consultation, your side, um, just to ensure that there is everything's done right and you're covered. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We've got a whole host of questions actually in relation to kit days. So I'll just quickly run through each of them. Mandy has asked, are kit days paid on top of SMP? So it depends what your policy says basically a lot of companies have a policy that talks about what you're going to do in the event of a kit day um if you you wouldn't pay somebody twice for the same thing as well so if an employee works a kit day and it's during the period where they're still entitled to smp what we would generally do is we would offset the smp against the full day's pay um, some companies don't even pay kit days, they give days in lieu to take when the employee's back at work, that's another option. Um, or if it's during the time when she's on unpaid maternity, pay, uh, maternity leave, then she would just get her normal rates. Well, and Jen has also asked, can an employee split their 10 kit days into 20 half days? No, so any, any work is counted as a full kit day. So if your employee returns to work and only works an hour in that day, that um, for our purposes is called a kit day and that's it, that's done, they've taken one day. I suppose what, what could be utilised if, if the employee would want to work more than the 10 kit days and you need them to work more, what you could do is the employee could um give no notice bring her maternity leave to an end and then go on shared parental leave which is slightly different and then with shared parental leave they have their own entitlement to a kit like day which is called a split day um and an employee on shared parental leave can take up to 20 split days so they could work the 10 days during the maternity leave bring the maternity leave to an end apply for a shared parental leave and go on shared parental leave and then do um, split days. So there are other options. If both sides would want 
more work done during the maternity leave period uh, there are options and they also might want to share that leave with a partner as well so who then also would get the 20 split days so it depends on a case-by-case -case basis um, it's quite a complex thing so if you've got a case where you want to do that and you're considering it and your employer's considering it just give us a call thank you Linda some of these questions are quite complex so I will run through them but if we want to take them outside of the webinar then we can do as well we can contact you afterwards and Neve is asking some questions in relation to annual pay reviews and she's asked if we do annual pay reviews while someone is already on maternity leave and make it effective for when they return to work does that contravene alabaster rule it, it doesn't contravene alabaster rule but you do that in addition to the alabaster rule so what you do is you recalculate the 90 percent maternity pay taking into account what that 90 percent pay would have been with this pay rise so like i said your, your payroll company should do it for you i know more pay used to do it for me um, and it's just a recalculation of the um 90 percent rule right okay it's a bit complex so um yeah like i say your payroll company should do it for you okay um let's have a quick look and see some more questions have come through we've got a question through from and uh, let's have a quick look um lucy has asked should ivf leave be treated in any way like maternity or rather as sickness or as holiday okay so I'll guess what you mean by IVF rule. Um, so if an employee is undergoing IVF, then when they go for their original appointments, that's just treated the same as any other medical appointment. Once the eggs are implanted into the lady's womb, she should be treated like she's pregnant until a test tells you otherwise. So from the moment the eggs are planted, then for all intents and purposes, she is pregnant. So if she has any appointments, treat her like you would a pregnant employee. Um, hopefully, you know, it's all successful and then she continues to be pregnant. But then if, if the pregnancy test is then negative and they're not pregnant, then you stop treating them like a pregnant employee. So um, it, it's all to do with when the eggs are planted. Thank you, Linda. We've also had a question regarding how miscarriage should be handled. Should it be handled as sickness or compassionate leave or potentially both? Um, generally, sick, um, generally, it would be treated as sickness because um, she and if an employee is reporting herself as unfit for work due to miscarriage, um, then she's sick um if you if she is suffering after that and she's physically fine but not mentally if you want to offer some form of compassionate leave i suppose you could but there's no legal obligation to offer anyone statutory compassionate leave that's generally down to the company that what they would want to do um it would generally be sick normally unless you wanted to make an additional provision provision as a company we've also had a question from anna in relation to fixed term contracts so what if an employee is on a fixed term contract and that finishes while they're on maternity leave so if it's a genuine it depends what, what you whether your question is in relation to pay or the actual employment but um if she qualified for maternity pay and a fixed term contract was coming to an end um, while she was off on leave, she would continue to get the pay because she's qualified for it. Um, so her pay would continue. She could be made a lever from, the, from an employment perspective. So she would have a letter confirming a fixed term contract ended, um, but she would st could still be on payroll um, receiving her um, maternity pay if you want to pay her up at the point of dismissal you have to get her agreement in writing because um, there's an impact to national insurance contributions she would have to make greater national insurance contributions therefore she would she suffers a detriment as a result of being paid everything in a block 
So you'd have to get agreement to pay her off. In regards to actually dealing with the fixed term contract and bringing it to an end, I would advise that you take advice on a case by case basis, much the same as redundancy. Um, we would speak to the employee. She should fully know what's happening. There should be no question over the work continuing beyond that point, because if there is, then I would advise that you do not dismiss and I would advise you take advice on a case by case basis. Thank you, Linda. We've got time for just a few more questions. We've had a question come through in relation to what if an employee wants to return back to work part time and that doesn't suit the needs of the business? In that case, they would apply for flexible working. Um, we've got an obligation to try and allow the reduction if possible. If we can't, there are a number of reasons we can reject a flexible working request. Things like additional cost to the business, um, just doesn't suit the business demand, not enough work in the um, time period maybe that they want to work, um, that it has a detrimental effect on the business in one way or another. There are reasons for rejecting it. Again, we'd need to discuss it and take advice um, on a case by case basis. You do not always have to accommodate a flexible working request. If you're going to reject it, I would have very strong business rationale for it and I would have at least one of the allowed reasons for rejection um, because you're potentially you know, going to be stopping somebody from returning to work maybe. So there might be a claim at the end of it. Um, take advice, please. Thank you, Linda. Um, I'll just have a quick look. We've also got questions around antenatal appointments. Is all time off for antenatal appointments fully paid? Yes. Yeah, so antenatal appointments should be paid in full. We shouldn't. We shouldn't be asking employees to rearrange appointments um, outside working hours. Um, if they if they happen to have an antenatal appointment and it's in working hours, they should be allowed to go and be paid in full for it. Great, thank you. Um, we'll just finish with one last question that we've had through from Chris. And Chris has asked, is the first two weeks of compulsory leave in addition to the 52 weeks maternity or included within that? And are these first two weeks paid at the 90% rate or does that start after the two weeks? So, good question. So basically the two, week, the two weeks compulsory leave are part of the 52 weeks. Um, it, it's just some people don't want to take maternity leave. Um, I know somebody that had her own business and went back to work, I think the week after she had a baby. Um, so that was her choice. It was her business. But when, when you're an employee, you legally have to take them two weeks. Um, and they are the two weeks direct after the baby's birth. Yes, they are part of the 52 weeks. They're not in addition to the 52 weeks. And Yes, they may be paid at 90%. However, they may not be. It depends where they fall in relation to the baby's birth. So if an employee goes off 11 weeks before the baby's birth for one reason or another, she may be outside of the six, uh, the six weeks at 90% when she gives birth. So really, the, 90, the two weeks and the 90% aren't really connected. It's just important to note that if you've got an employee that is maybe chomping at the bits come straight back to work um, and maybe her partner is going to you know take the rest of the time with the baby she physically has to take them two weeks after the baby's birth off irrelevant to any of the other leaves she can transfer the rest of the leave to a partner that's fine it's just them two weeks are compulsory thank you linda and thank you to everybody who asked a question Now, moving on to connecting with more pay. If you follow us on any of our social sites, we publish all of our new blogs and HR and employment law guides on there. So you'll see them flash up on your news feed. There's lots of useful content in there. And following on from that, if you're interested in finding out more about our HR and employment law service, we're running a live demonstration on Thursday, the 18th of July at 2 p.m. You can register for the demo on the website in the resources section. And there's also a link at the bottom of this slide. 
I hope you found the webinar today useful. As mentioned, I will be sending out a copy of the recording and also the slides. We'll close the webinar now. I hope you have a lovely day and hopefully we will have you registering on another webinar soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.